And so we're going to go back and just review just a few points. And our text verse is found in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 says, But I fear, lest by any means is the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And I haven't read the next verse, but I want to tonight, because you just you read the next verse, it's incredible, it's powerful. In fact, there are some preachers I know that don't even know this verse is in the Bible, wouldn't believe it's here. For he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if ye receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, we might well bear with him. For I suppose it was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all these things. And what he's saying there is, is that if the enemy can subtly, sneakily, so cunningly, so deceptively, get us thinking the wrong direction and thinking the wrong thoughts, he can literally push off a totally different Jesus to us and a totally different gospel to us and a totally different spirit than the Spirit of God. How many can see that? You see, he links that truth to this incredible statement that there are coming some who are going to be used of the enemy to lie so much to your thinking that you're going to start believing in a Jesus that's the wrong one. You're going to start believing in a gospel that's not even the true gospel. It's another gospel. And then the most powerful thing is, you don't even realize it, but it's another spirit. It's not even the spirit of the Lord anymore. It's a, another spirit. So you see how dangerous this is. You see how fundamental this is. If the enemy can get us deceived in us believing who we really are, he's got us pray for the worst of possible things. And this, of course, is why Revelation, and you can put that verse up there, but in Revelation, <clears throat> the main text there of chapter 12, there in verse 9, it outlines... Satan and his activity, and it makes it very clear that he goes about in what deceives the whole world. Now, I want to give you several quick one-line thoughts that I gave you the last time we were together, and hopefully you found them and have them. Christ as Christians... Knowing our true spiritual identity is the master key. There you got it. Perfect. To unlock the door of victory in every area of your life. This is the master key. Knowing our true spiritual identity. And then I told you, also, that we don't have to work to be someone we already are. The enemy wants to trick Christians into performance-based activity, religious activity, instead of our true freedom and liberty in Christ. And identity creates performance, not the other way around. As I've taught you, and I want to just remind you, I'm not going to reteach it, but I thoroughly showed you how our performance comes out of our identity. And what is our identity? 
Paul made it clear, if any man is in Christ, he is a what class? New creature. New creation. Old things passed away, and behold, all things are become new. That's who you are. That is who you are. You're not an old sinner saved by grace. That's who you are. You are a new, if you've been born again, then you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Somebody comes along and wants to refute a message like this or come and present another gospel and say, well, you know, if you just preach that, then you'll just give, you'll just give all of them a license to sin. I got news for you. I've never met a true born-again Christian who desires a license to sin. I've never found one. I'm sorry. If you feel like preaching like this is giving somebody a license to sin, it's because they're not a new creature yet. If you're a new creature, you don't want to sin. You're not looking for a license, and beside, I find saints sin enough with a license or without a license. It doesn't really matter. So I don't think preaching the Bible <laughs> is going to relate people stop sinning or not sinning. No, the Word will transform us when we understand who we really are. And I taught you this before. If you haven't written it down, write it down. Your identity comes from your birth. Your identity comes from your birth. And if the Bible is true, and you know it is, this is the crux of the matter. Either Jesus meant what he said, or he didn't. Either when he had that conversation with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus basically was told by Jesus, the only way to see the kingdom of God is to be born from above. King James translates it born again, but if you really look at it in the original Greek, it means born from above. And remember the conversation? We all remember it well if you've ever read it. Nicodemus says, I don't get it. How in the world can I be born again if I got to go back in my mother's womb and come back out? Right? And you remember what he said. <clears throat> he said, no, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is is spirit so this body never got changed at the new birth it never really did but the spirit man on the inside hallelujah was born all over again born from above this time and so now we have what we call a new birth. <laughs> now, in the natural, I'm a Vancouvering. And I was born by, you know, given birth by Rebecca and David Vancouvering. I've never had one day ever worrying about, well, I think I'm a Kennedy. <laughs> I want to be a Kennedy real bad. I can want to be, but it doesn't change anything. I'm a Vancouvering. You ever seen my dad? Okay, there you go. Like I tell people, you've seen me, you've seen my father. I mean, how in the world can I run from that seed? I mean, I mean every day I look in the mirror, it scares me. I say, man, I look, I look more like my father all the time. Think about what I just said. The more I live, the more I grow, I'm looking more like my father all the time. That's what I'm talking about. When I understand that natural birth, I, 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 I don't get up in the morning and wonder whether I'm a Vancouver. I don't get up in the morning and, want, and think, well, Dad's going to kick me out of the family. I'm not going to be a Vancouver. No, I am a Vancouver, period, whether I like it or not, good and bad, whatever comes with the DNA, that's who I am. That's my identity. Folks, that's the natural Joe, the spirit Joe. The spiritual Joe, I have a heavenly father now. I've been born into a brand new spiritual family. Glory to God. My identity is now God's child. 
I'm a son of the Father now. Hallelujah. Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus was the first begotten from the dead and among many brethren? That's us. That's who we are. So if I'll begin to identify who I really am, I'll stop trying to find out who I am in my performance and rather know who I am in Christ and let him live in me. Now that's the tricky part, that letting him live through me. But here's what I believe is the key, and I want to get right to it. Don't hang out in the cemetery. I don't know any other way to say it. Write that down. I showed you earlier that our old life has passed away, but we came when we came to Christ, right? We're no longer the people we were before we became Christians is what I'm saying. Can you say amen? When somebody passes away, guess what? You have a funeral. And you lay the body to rest. In fact, I just did that yesterday. Our precious Joyce. What a precious woman of God. Incredible, mighty pastor. Some of you remember Pastor Joyce Frolic. In fact, she would be here on Wednesday nights, oftentimes last year. And uh, she went home to be with the Lord this past week. 74 years of age. And I was just at the funeral yesterday. Incredible home going. But we have a funeral when somebody passes away, right? We have a funeral. We say goodbye to that person. Living according to our old identity is like hanging out at the cemetery long after the funeral is over. I, I know the question that a lot of believers raise when you start talking about this. Well, if our old life has passed away then why do we still want to do the same old bad things? And that's a critical issue, and I'm going to deal with it. Not tonight specifically, but in this series, I'm going to, I'm going to hammer on that. I'm going to have a whole message built on that one thought. I promise I'll get there. If you keep coming, I'll get there, because that has to be dealt with. But let me just remind you, even though we've been born again the inside, we still live in bodies that are corrupted by sin, right? So that really is your answer right there, but I'm going to deal with it in more detail. But as long as we're on this earth, we're going to carry a principle of sin to a certain measure, and the Bible says there is nothing good in our flesh, that old life, and that there is a struggle going on. I get that. We're going to deal with that. But before we get there, the foundation is what I'm preaching to you concerning your identity because here's what I believe. I believe we have every means by God given to us to live victoriously over sin. Now, that's what I believe. Now, some theologians don't, some preachers don't, some Christians don't. I get it. Now, where do I base this on? Go to 1 John. And again, my purpose is I'm laying still, really, even a few weeks down this road, I'm still laying foundation to help you grasp the reality of your new identity. In 1 John chapter 3, and I taught this oh, some time back. I'd have to look at my ledger and I keep a track of every sermon I preach so I'd have to go back and figure out when it was but not too far back I taught in detail on this on a Sunday morning I know I did but when you begin to grasp the reality of your new identity why is that important because when you know who you are in Christ, nothing can stop you from living right and wanting to do right. 
And that's why the Bible says that He has given us His divine nature that lives on the inside of us. I can sin as a Christian, but I am not to practice sin as a Christian. And let me show you. Where do you get that? It's right here. 1 John 3. Let's read into this, starting in verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called... There it is. Who are we? Come on, who are you? We are the sons and the daughters of God, the children of God. Is that not what I just said a few moments ago? This is the premise. This is, this is how he's starting this. This is how he is making this known to us. Now, he's about to talk about sin in just a few verses, but before he ever gets to sin, he tells us and reminds us who we are. My God, can you see that? That's what I'm doing. Because that's, that's where victory is found. This great love that was given to us that we should be the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Immediately, because we are of God's family, that immediately puts us at odds with the world. Say amen. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him, what? Purifies himself even as he is pure. So notice there's two elements there. There's the purifying process, but there's the purifying promise. There is no purifying process without, first of all, the purifying promise, which is he's made us pure. <laughs> in him, we are already pure. But we're in this process of purification. Now, here's where it gets heavy, but this is where the, the good stuff is. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now that's the key right there. Because that's what I'm preaching to you. Our identity in him. When we live in him, <laughs> hallelujah, sin will no longer be the issue or the problem. Because there's no sin in him. That's what it says. Whoso abides in him doesn't sin. Look at that. Now, I know some Christians hate that verse because they, cause, 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 you know, they, they, they can't seem to find victory in a certain area of their life. But the fact is, stop hating that verse. Embrace that verse. Stop disliking the Bible, start loving the Bible. It's true. As long as I'm in him, I'm not going to sin. Now, I don't believe there's sinless perfection in any of us. There's only sinless perfection in him. But if I'm living in him, hallelujah. How many can see that? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth <coughs> hath not seen him, neither known him. <coughs> Little children, let no man deceive you. Now, why did he put that in there? Go back to our very starting verse in Corinthians 11. Why did I pick that verse to base this series on? Because that's what it all is. Somebody has lied to us. Somebody has deceived us. The subtlety of Lucifer caused Eve to sin, and he says that has passed down on all of us as a result. So why would he talk about deception? Because that's, that's the foundation here. That's the key. 
Don't let anybody deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. And for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now here it is. Whosoever is born of God. How many of you have been born of God? Amen. If Jesus is Lord and you repented of your sins and ran to him and confessed him as Lord and fell on the, on the cross and said, Lord, it's your shed blood, and you put your faith in it, then you've been born of God. Then guess what? You're not to commit sin. There it is. Now why? Because his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Let's notice how the Amplified says this. Can you put that up in the Amplified? And don't go all the way back. Let's just pick it up. Say in the seventh verse. Actually, the sixth verse. What did it die? Did you lose it? Is it there? This same verse, 1 John 3, yeah, <laughs> right where we were. Look at 7, 8, and 9 in the Amplified. 6, 7, 8, 9. I'll get it out. Help me, Lord. No one who abides in him. Now he's going to define that who lives and remains in communion with and in obedience to him, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually, there's the key word, habitually, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually commits or practices sin. No one who habitually sins has either seen or known him, recognized, perceived, or understood him, or has had any experiential acquaintance with him. They don't know God at all. Next verse. Boys, lads, <laughs> let no one deceive and lead you astray. He who practices righteousness, who is upright, conforming to the divine will and purpose, thought, and action, living in consistently conscientious life. Boy, they put a lot of words in there, don't they? But I love it. Every word is powerful. He who practices righteousness. What does that mean? living upright, conforming to his will and purpose and thought and action, is righteous even as he is righteous. Next verse. But he who commits sin, who practices evil doing, is of the devil and takes his character, there it is, from the evil one. Now, folks, stop and think about it. We have been taken out, Colossians says, when we got born again, he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God's Son. So we no longer are linked to the devil. We're linked to Jesus. Say amen. Guess what happened when we were with the devil? We, did, we had the character of the devil because it was his life in us. But now that we're saved, hallelujah, the character of Jesus lives inside me. Amen. So no wonder we did evil and practiced evil because his character was, was in us. For the devil has sinned and violated the divine law from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God was made manifest and visible was to undo, undo, destroy, loosen, and dissolve. And I've taught in the past on those words, destroy, loosen, and dissolve the works of the dead, the works that the devil has done. Here, last verse, verse 9. Here it is. Here's the key. No one born or begotten of God deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin. For God's nature abides in him. Hallelujah. That's the best news you've ever heard. And it's true. 
All we got to do is start believing it, identifying in it. I got to read that again. No one born, begotten of God, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin, for God's nature abides in him, which is his principle of life, the divine sperm or seed remains permanently within him and he cannot practice sinning because he is begotten of God. Somebody say praise the Lord. Now, that means when somebody comes along and says, well, I'm just only human. Well, that's really not true anymore. I mean, Satan knows it, but he wants to keep us from knowing it so he can keep the handcuffs on us. I'm not just simply a sinning, sinful human being anymore. No, I'm now begotten of God. I have the seed, the sperma of God on the inside of me. And it makes me different. So, if we're not the people we used to be, who are we? What is our biblical designation? The Bible uses a lot of descriptive terms as titles for Christians. I won't get into all of them. Some of them are important. But one of the greatest that he gives us is found in Galatians 2.20. Turn to Galatians 2.20 because this is the master key that unlocks this whole revelation. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, contains the key principle for understanding our spiritual identity. And here's what this great verse says. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm alive. <laughs> Here's the great mystery. I died, but yet I'm alive. Yet not I, but, but who? Christ liveth in me. How many can see that's exactly what John was describing when he says, if you've been truly been born, begotten of God, his seed now remains in you. Same thing. Christ now lives through me. I died, but I'm alive. Why? Because Christ is alive in me. The divine sperma from heaven, his seed. How many know Jesus is his seed? Now is imparted to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No wonder my spirit came alive. No wonder I was dead in my sins and trespasses. But now the seed of God has germinated and taken root inside my spirit. Glory to God if we'll just believe it. And sometimes you, it's, you can't, if, you, if you're waiting to get it, to get your mind around it, it won't happen. you got to get your heart around it first. got to receive it down here in your heart as revelation. Then your mind will start getting in line with it. But your mind will go tilt, tilt, tilt. Don't you know what you did last night? Tilt, tilt, tilt. Don't you remember last week when you went and did such and such? Tilt, tilt, tilt. And the devil will sit there and what? The same thing he did with Eve. Through the subtlety, get our minds thinking thoughts away from this. I got news for you. If I will yield to Christ in me, it's impossible to yield to sin. If I'm yielding to Christ, I won't yield to sin. Come on, somebody. If I'm yielding to Christ in me, so I died, but I'm alive, but it's not really me. It's Christ who's alive in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, there's a whole lot here, but let me just dissect this a little. 
The first thing you understand is, according to Paul, you are a dead person. Joe Van Coovering died. Nevertheless, I'm a living dead person. Now, I see your mind's going tilt, 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 but that's what you just read. <laughs> Get your heart around it because the revelation will come. I died, but yet I'm alive. And because you are alive through Jesus Christ, it is he who now lives within you and me. So, and I, 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 <laughs> I ministered, I, I'm trying to remember when I preached it, but I preached a whole series on Sunday mornings, Dead Man Walking. Do you remember when I taught on that? Dead Man Walking. And this is the premise of that foundation. I think I taught it for two, three, four weeks, Dead Man Walking, to get across to us. This is the core verse. How many know crucifixion means death? All right. Write this down, and I don't think you have it on the screen. Whatever we were before we came to Christ, write it down. Whatever we were before we came to Christ died with him on the cross. Whatever we were before we came to Christ died with him on the cross and was buried when he was buried. Hallelujah. It was buried with him. Did everybody get that? Whatever we were before we came to Christ, died with him on the cross and was buried when he was buried. And for that reason, I don't like that phrase, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. It would be more accurate to say we were sinners before we were saved by grace. But God has a different designation for us. And that's why the New Testament calls us over and over again saints and not sinners. Now, here's, here's, here's a question. Because this is going to sound like a contradiction, and it's not at all. Does anybody know what the most carnal, sin-riddled church in the New Testament was? Who knows? Corinth. Corinth. Paul spent more time bringing correction to the church in Corinth than we have, that we have record of in the New Testament. It was the most messed up group of Christians you could imagine. Amen. They not only tolerated an incestuous situation in the church, they bragged about it. I mean, when these folks came to church... It's described there by Paul. They sit on opposite sides because they were mad at each other. <laughs> the Corinthians were also stuffing themselves and getting drunk at church during the Lord's Supper. Paul even wrote to them and said, some folks have died early because of what y'all are doing. I mean, he said God's discipline is some, come and taking some of you out of here early because you don't know what you're doing. How many of that's in there? <clears throat> and of course, 1 Corinthians 13, the great chapter on love, we all get teary-eyed over it. It was actually a stinging rebuke 
to this church that lacked love. That's why he finishes it and says, I can pray in tongues all I want. I can have all the gifts of the Spirit. I can have great faith to move mountains. It does mean, in other words, they had all that. But they didn't have love. They didn't have the most important thing. How many starting to get the idea? Paul had very little commendation to the church at Corinth. Most of it was rebuke. Most of it was correction. But yet, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, and buckle up. And notice what Paul calls this bunch. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1 and 2, right at the beginning. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Wait a minute! Saints by calling? Sanctified in Jesus? Didn't look like it to me. That's why we're looking at the wrong thing, folks. The word saint literally means set apart. I've taught on this many, many times. Our Greek word comes from the original Hebrew word kadosh, holy, that God alone is kadosh. And the word for holy that is used throughout the Bible is literally set apart unto God. Set apart from the world and separated and set apart unto God. I've taught on this in the past. It speaks of our relationship to Christ. We belong to Him now. In other words, what I'm trying to show you is this is our true identity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul's message to the Corinthians was one we're becoming familiar with. You're not the same people you used to be before you got saved. Even though you're doing a lot of the same dumb things, and we need to get that straightened out, but God calls you saints. Do you realize that believers are called saints? Do the math. Check it out. Six, over 60 times in the New Testament. We as believers are called saints. Now some may be carnal saints. <laughs> some may feel like defeated saints. And some may even think of themselves as sinning saints. But we're still God's saints. We are God's set-apart ones. And that name... I don't know about you, but it gives me great hope. Once we understand that we are saints, then we can begin to work with Him in this process. I know Christians that are still harassed by stupid habits that they can't seem to lick and break. Whether you realize it or not, what I'm teaching you tonight is the master key for you breaking those silly fleshly habits that, that still harass you. As long as you identify yourself with that stinking little habit, you are going to continue to perform that habit. But once you align yourself with who I am in Christ... Amen. I don't have to do that. The devil's told me for years that that's just who I am. I got to do that. No, you don't. That's not who you are. How many of you are hearing this tonight? Glory to God. I, I, I know I keep hammering and re-saying in different ways. It's the same thing. It, 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 it's the master key. 
the thing that gives me hope is he calls me his saint. That means I am separated unto him. Now, if I begin to see myself as his saint, and it means separated unto him, then why am I meddling with the things of this world? Because he separated me unto himself. Come on, somebody. I don't need that junk. Why? Because he's called me his saint. I'm separated unto him. And if I'll allow him to live through me, I won't yield to sin. I showed it to you. I won't practice sin. You're not just a patched up, converted sinner. And as long as you think of yourself that way and see yourself as that way and identify yourself as that, then you'll just stay defeated. No, you are holy in God's sight. You are already separated unto him. Well, man, I sure blow it. Forget that for a minute. Well, I sure do get ugly. Forget that for a minute. See who he's called you. Now, what are you going to identify with? Are you going to identify with that old, nasty, good-for-nothing, lying cheat that you used to be? Or are you going to identify with who he now calls you? I choose to identify with who he now calls me to be. Because the only way out of that performance and the only way out of those actions is to begin to identify with who he's made me now. Stop trying to resurrect somebody who died. If I will see that old man as dead and stop hanging out at the graveyard. Come on, somebody. Can you get this? I'm really not frustrated or angry. I'm excited. I, I know it sounds like I'm mad. I'm not mad. I'm telling you, I'm preaching myself happy because there's power in the gospel. There is power in this. The devil is lying to you, telling you you're going to be bound to that thing your whole life. That's the problem. You've been listening to that dumb devil. Start believing the word. Start entertaining what he has said about you. Stop listening to what the devil says wants to call you. Amen. How many can get that? I like the analogy of the caterpillars and the butterflies. We've all heard it, and it's really biblical. When was the last time you heard someone call a butterfly a converted caterpillar? I mean, it was a caterpillar. But now it's taken on a whole new character. Whole new nature, whole new name. Now it's beautiful with all kinds of giftedness. It was an ugly, little, squirmy, brown, gray, spotted, smelly worm. Yuck. That's what we were. Amen. We were dead in our sins. We, was, we were yuck. We were yuck, that worm, but then something happened. The miracle of metamorphosis occurred. And guess what happened to that little ugly, wormy, smelly thing? It got born again. Amen, it got born again. And it stopped being the worm and came out a beautiful butterfly. Now, folks, that is what I'm trying to say to you. <laughs> it was a caterpillar, but it's taken on a whole new character, whole new name. It may be wounded, it may be broken and defeated butterfly, but it's still a butterfly. And see, before you and I met Christ, we were spiritually that worm, that caterpillar. You may have been good looking or not. You may have been well-connected caterpillar or not. You may have been wealthy and educated, but you were still a wormy caterpillar. Amen. A caterpillar you were, no matter what. However, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you became a butterfly. Glory to God. Now I'm called a saint. And see, this is the difference. Let's get practical as I close out this message for now. 
and ask the question, so what? What, does it, what difference does it make that I'm now a saint? And I hinted at this difference earlier, but let me spell it out. If you know Jesus Christ, and let's just say you're still struggling with something that you know is on Christ-like, I didn't hammer homosexuals, I don't hammer people. But I made it clear early on in the series, if you remember, that's the great lie that we're combating in society today. The whole homosexual, radical, same-sex marriage agenda wants us to believe that God made them this way, that they were born this way. And I'm trying to tell you that that is a lie that has been spoken to them so long that they now embrace that as truth. I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know why. I was praying for someone, and it was like it just hit me. I even mentioned it to Rob the other day when we were driving somewhere, but it hit me. I, I know many uh, people, believe it or not, I mean, not intimately and not like they hang out with me in my house, but, I mean, over the years... I've crossed paths and met and ministered to. We just had one not long ago. This, this, this past week we had a man that's, you know, been in a homosexual lifestyle for what, 20, I mean, 20, 30 years, basically his whole life that Rob and I ministered to just this past week in our office for nearly an hour. So we, I mean, we constantly, I say constantly, not every day or every week, but regularly in ministry, I've, I've had much interaction with gays and lesbians and those involved with homosexual lifestyle, and it hit me. I never really thought about it before. It hit me, and I told Rob, I says, you know what? I don't know one happy gay person. Isn't that just like the devil? Now look at that. They want to call themselves gay. Everyone I've ever met, everyone I've ever ministered to, they're miserable. They're suicidal. They're trying to kill them. They hate themselves. They, I'm telling you, there's nothing happy or gay about anyone living that way. But notice, they want to take that name. Why? Because they want to try to change their identity. The same way God uses the truth of who we are so that we identify with who we are in Christ, they're trying to find something that's like the devil's come along and give them a substitute that's nothing like, it's total opposite of their real life, but they like to use that name because they really want to try to be happy. Can you see the lie of the devil in that? Now, I said all that to say this. That is not who God made that individual to be. So if you say you know Jesus Christ, but yet you're still struggling with homosexual desires, here's what I want to tell you. You are not a homosexual. You are a saint. You are a child of God. And the enemy is trying to keep straddled on you the old man that was buried when you came to Christ. Come on, somebody. Amen, amen. That truth. So this is what I'm talking about. This is the difference that it makes. See, you are a saint whom Satan wants to dupe into believing that you're trapped in this behavior because this is really the way God made you. That's the lie. God didn't make you that way. God now calls you his saint. The difference is that knowing your true identity gives you hope for change. And there's nothing more hopeless than being told you have no way out of your problem. In fact, Rob can testify to this after we ministered to this young man for nearly an hour. I mean, you, you, you talked to him before I even got there, and I know we ministered to him for nearly an hour. You remember the last thing I told him? Remember the last thing? I, it was just that we were so leather. I, just, I wanted to give you hope. Remember that? I said, just, I, I, if I can just give you hope, because I knew going in, if, if, he'll never find faith if he has no hope. 
Hope precedes faith. So if there's ever faith that's going to see this man change or begin to walk with Christ in any meaningful way, I've got to first give him hope. Because right now, when you get so trapped by the devil, you lose all that hope. You think you're going to stay that addict forever. You think you're going to stay bound by that thing forever. So the difference is that knowing your true identity gives you hope for change. Because there's nothing more hopeless than being told you have no way out of your problem. But as I said earlier, truth, the truth of our identity in Christ also may, means we do have something to get out of these wrong actions with. Now let me give you a real life illustration. that I'll close with. <clears throat> One of the best illustrations of this problem is one I see all the time in pastoral ministry. And it occurs with married people who still want to think and act as if they're single. Most people understand that when we get married, they are surrendering their singleness. Because now I'm what? I'm becoming married. That means what you did as a single person is largely irrelevant now. And unfortunately, some married people don't see why a little thing like a wedding should interfere with their lifestyle trying to make a point here some married men still want to go out and hang out with the guys and come in when they feel like it just like they did before they got married so to them getting married means little more than just adding a wife to their list of hobbies and interests how many know that ain't gonna fly there's failure down that road and see, our society encourages this kind of schizophrenic thinking about marriage by encouraging people and couples to pursue their own separate careers, their own separate lives. It's really a setup. In today's world, the marriage is more like a business arrangement instead of a lifelong covenant commitment. And when these people say, well, I'm the same person I was before I got married. They mean that literally. And I'm not saying husbands and wives can't pursue their careers and can't be successful separate from their spouse. How I many know I'm not saying that either? Amen. I know many men that are happy coming home and doing the dishes and the laundry and, and fixing dinner and doing the shopping and letting a gifted wife pursue a career, but they're still a union together. What I'm trying to say is you aren't single anymore when you become married. You now have a new identity. Now let me tell you something. Satan needs to get used to the fact that you don't belong to him anymore. He needs to understand that things are different now. You have a new name, a new relationship. You don't live where you used to live anymore. The sin that used to tie you up doesn't have any power over you any longer. Why? Because that's not who I am anymore. I'm sure you're familiar with the Federal Witness Protection Program. How many of you ever heard about that? It was a movie I watched not long ago, and they had, to, they had this kid who was the, uh, the main witness to this killing of a mobster. And anyway, at the end of the movie, they had to take the, the kid and the mother and his brother and basically send them to another city, give them another name, and totally change them for their own protection. How many of you ever heard of things like that? It, it's done regularly. 
If a government case has a key witness whose life may be in danger, they keep that witness hidden away even before the trial. But once the witness takes the stand and testifies to that mafia kingpin, and again, I just saw this movie, The Witness, I think is what it was called, a boy running from a mafia killers, and that's what the whole story was about, and that's why I, I thought about this. The basic objective of the witness protection program is really simple. It's designed to give the endangered person a new identity. My God, you're going to get this as I wrap this up. This is going to make sense to you. You're never going to forget this. A new identity. He and the family are relocated, given new names. Their old identities are, for all practical purposes, erased from the record as if they never existed. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. All of this is done so the enemy can't make any claim on their life. Amen. That's what Jesus did for us. It's time for a lot of Christians to stand up and testify against the devil and be put in federal witness protection program. Glory to God. I'm in a protection program now from Satan. Why? Because I'm a witness for truth. I'm a witness for Christ. My prayer is that when the truth of your new identity gets down in your soul and deep in your spirit, you're going to come out against the enemy. You're going to step into that courtroom of heaven and say, I'm no longer under Satan's lousy authority. I've been made new by the blood of Christ. And I'm not going to let the devil intimidate me anymore. Glory to God. See, when you come out against him, the devil isn't going to like it. But God has this wonderful witness protection program. He set us all up for a brand new identity. Hallelujah. The old records have been erased, which means they aren't even there anymore. Satan can't dig them up and say, remember this? No, 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 that's gone. Huh? That guy's dead. <laughs> Don't you understand? The guy that did that's dead, Satan. Come on, somebody. The guy that did that's dead, Satan. Just I'm dead. That, that guy died. You can't use that on me. He can't locate you anymore because you don't live where you used to live. Come on, how many can see that? Are you ready to enter God's witness protection program? Because it's good for all eternity. Stand with me and let's pray. Hallelujah. I don't know if I blessed you tonight, but I preached myself happy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil is still a liar. Hallelujah. If you can just get your eyes on the right thing. If you can just get the right perspective tonight. The devil is trying to deceive you and blind you. Get you to look at the wrong thing. Because if you look at the wrong thing long enough, then you'll start believing the wrong thing. Your belief will follow your vision. What is set before your spiritual eyes is what you will ultimately pursue. So change what you're looking at. Change what, what, what you're perceiving and seeing. Because when you can begin to change that, everything else around you will change. Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice right now tonight. And Lord, I know good and well. Lord, if I didn't even know it in the natural, I know it by the Spirit. Lord, there's, there's, there's people listening to me right now. People under the sound of my voice right now. In the natural, the enemy has told them they're always going to be bound by that. They're always going to be connected to that failure and that sin and that shortcoming and that weakness. And Lord, I just speak liberty to every mind. Lord, you've already given us freedom in our spirit. Lord, I speak to the thinking and the minds and the thoughts, Lord, where the enemy has lied for so long. Give us eyes to see who we are in Christ. And, Lord, out of that will come all the freedom. Hallelujah. All of the freedom and holiness and, and the lifestyle, Lord, that you created us to live one that's pleasing to you. 
Lord, we, we don't need to be up today and down tomorrow and up the next day and down the next and jump back and forth and in and out and up and down in our spiritual walk. Lord, we can, we don't have to do that. We can, we can, we can live with an, on an even keel, Lord, just pursuing you and the knowledge of God. And I just pray for that one right now who I have such a burden for tonight that feels like they'll never get free of this. Father, in Jesus' name, let them see tonight you have already set them free from this. You have already declared them free from this. Now, Lord, let them just see who they are in you. Let us find our identity in you for your glory. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Next time we get together, we'll go into a whole brand new aspect of this. So get ready. That was the end of the introduction. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Amen.